uh, where where these things sit at the intersection of these two these two fields. All right, so uh, I want to pose start by posing uh, the following questions, which uh, you're likely familiar with. So the first is the isometric embedding problem, namely, can I take a sphere uh, and find a C1 isometric embedding into a ball of radius epsilon? And I have here some pictures of such an embedding, and you can see that there's these uh, sequences of corrugations which uh, live at finer and finer scales and become visible as you zoom in. And it turns out that uh, this type of question has an analog in the context of the Euler equations, which describe an ideal and compressible fluid. And uh, the way I'll phrase that question is whether or not one can construct solutions which do not conserve the kinetic energy. And of course, the answer to these two questions is yes. The theorem that I'm speaking about is an example of an answer to the second question. And uh, all right, so uh, on the physical side of things, uh, I'm uh, I take motivation from turbulence, and so I have uh, some pictures here. Uh, this picture of the candle flame is right from Wikipedia, and I like it because it shows both the laminar region of the fluid and the turbulent or chaotic portion of the flow. And this is a simulation of a two-dimensional uh, turbulent velocity field with nice swirls and eddies. And one aspect of uh, the study of turbulence is something called intermittency, which we heard mentioned in uh, uh, Xiao Yitao's talk. And for the time being, uh, you can think of intermittency as being synonymous with sparsity. And here's a picture of the Cantor function. This is right from the chapter on intermittency uh, in Frisch's book. And we'll return to that um, a bit later. And then uh, so, somehow uh, this uh, measurement of uh, turbulent velocity field in the wake of a jet, it exhibits some of these uh, same intermittent properties. All right, so uh, the theorem that I'm speaking about today is joint work with uh, Tristan Buckmaster, uh, Nadar Mas Moody, and Vlad Bacall. And it says that we can construct non conservative intermittent weak solutions to the 3D Euler equations. So, non conservative, of course, we saw that means that uh, the kinetic energy is not conserved. And intermittent, we have a rough idea of what it means. I'll give it a little bit more meaning later by saying that these solutions possess almost one half of the derivative in L2, and uh, I'll tell you roughly what that means, but perhaps uh, more importantly, I should motivate why that's an interesting sort of regularity threshold uh, to think about. All right, so I want to start with a toy problem, and my apologies if you've seen this before, or if you're one of the two authors of the survey paper uh, from which I learned this example, but nonetheless, uh, here goes. So uh, suppose I give you a smooth function, um, say one half of sine two pi x, and I want you to construct a function z infinity, which is equal to plus or minus one almost everywhere, and approximates uh, z zero in sufficiently weak topologies. And of course, this approximation can't be made in a pointwise sense, or even in the mean, so I, I need a sufficiently weak topology for this to work. And there's an algorithm for producing uh, such a function z infinity. And uh, the idea is basically you take uh, your previous iterate and then you add to it some measurement of the error in the sense that one minus zq squared is how far I am away from satisfying the first constraint. And then I have this high frequency object multiplying it. And that sort of basic, uh, basic idea is really uh, what a Nash iteration is, and it's at the heart of the construction that we use to produce solutions to the Euler equations. All right, so I have some pictures of uh, the iterates here. And we can see the oscillations starting to develop. And then by the time we get to here, we're really collecting some values at plus or minus one and then oscillating uh, quite monstrously in between. And uh, this idea of uh, the topology being relevant for this sort of approximation problem will reoccur later. The basic idea is if the basic idea is if I have sort of all my topologies ordered by strongest to weakest, there's some threshold at which uh, above the threshold, 
the problem exhibits some kind of rigidity and I can't make this approximation and below the threshold, uh, these approximations are, are, are numerous. All right, so what, what, sh what does such a threshold problem look like in the context of the Euler equations? Um, so I have my fluid velocity U uh, just on the three-dimensional torus and I have uh, the kinetic energy. And for me, flexibility means non-conservation of the kinetic energy and rigidity means conservation. And if one writes down uh, the Euler equations, it, it turns out that rigidity is basically a byproduct of this particular integral identity. And uh, for divergence-free vector fields with bounded gradients, this is just an exercise to show that this is zero and that implies rigidity. But uh, it's actually a theorem that uh, if U has one third of a derivative in L3, then this integral identity holds. And I, let me just give a sort of barbaric motivation for why that's the threshold. I have three copies of U and one differential operator. If I divide it up evenly among each copy of U, I have one third of a derivative of U. And this expression is trilinear, so we measure in L3. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this was, uh, yeah, so this is the rigid side of, of this uh, flexibility rigidity problem. And the flexibility side um, was resolved in the past several years, building on ideas that uh, Camilo and Laszlo introduced to the community. And uh, it says that one can produce solutions uh, which have almost one third of the derivative in L infinity and which do not conserve the kinetic energy. And this threshold of one third of a derivative is the Ansager conjecture, uh, conjectured by uh, Ansager 70 years ago. I guess it's the Ansager theorem now, perhaps. All right, so I'm going to insist on, on these funny fractional derivatives and uh, we'll see why in a second, but uh, I can take inspiration by looking at uh, simulations and experiments and asking whether or not uh, dissipation of energy is observed. If this... Uh, uh, yeah, you can think about it like that. I'll write something down on the next slide, but for now, let's... Uh, whichever defini definition you like. All right, so uh, the question is, do turbulent fluids in experiments and simulations dissipate the energy? And Hyunju alluded to this or mentioned this in her talk. Uh, the answer is yes, and this is the zeroth law of turbulence. And I'm being a little bit more precise here by saying that uh, the rate of dissipation of the kinetic energy, uh, even in the limit of zero viscosity, is strictly positive. And I'm saying in the limit of zero viscosity because, of course, if I have a very viscous fluid and I perturb it, it'll come back to rest at some point. But this is saying something else. It's saying that the uh, dissipation of energy is coming from not, not, not the viscosity, but something else. And Ansager in 1949 uh, has this quote, which uh, it's evident that he uh, really sort of grasps uh, something interesting about what's happening here. All right. All right, so we know that uh, turbulent solutions should dissipate the energy, and that means then we're stuck with these weak solutions. And I want to understand how weak they are or how badly behaved they are. And uh, in mathematical language, uh, to measure how rough a function is, I would start taking derivatives. And of course, this is just uh, the gradient of U with the difference quotient. Um, but as, as we saw on the last slide, we need fractional derivatives. So I'm just going to change the exponent on this operator sort of heuristically speaking, and then that corresponds to just changing the power of the uh, difference quotient, the, the magnitude of z in the, in, the, in the denominator of this quantity. And uh, if you get bored of my talk, perhaps uh, you could just as a fun, fun little uh, aside, try and calculate for which uh, values of s this quantity is finite for something like the Cantor function. Uh, I, I put S of P because uh, it should depend on P. All right, so in 1941, Kolmogorov formulated a phenomenological theory of turbulence, 
And uh, very roughly speaking, what he postulated was that if I take measurements which look something like this, these sort of fractional derivatives, then turbulent solutions of fluid equations have one third of a derivative in LP for all P. And an example of such a function which would have this type of uh, regularity is, is, is this sum of sine waves. And of course I put uh, K on three in the denominator uh, on purpose. All right, but there's really a difference between what this object look, looks like and what something like that object looks like. They're fundamentally different. All right, so given these predictions of Kolmogorov, one can then ask uh, whether or not he was right. And at the level of the, uh, at, the, at the level of L3 regularity of my function, uh, it sure looks like Kolmogorov was exactly correct. In the turbulence community, this is known as the four-fifths law. But for other values of P, um, it's, it's, it's an active area of research, I, I should say. People still uh, try and figure out what the correct uh, regularity exponent is in the context of uh, L2. And L2 is convenient because I can take the Fourier transform and measure the energy spectrum and whatnot of my function. And uh, people work on this even, even in recent years. So uh, a year ago, Iyer, Strini, Boston, and Young did a direct numerical simulation of, uh, and, and measured this sort of L2 regularity, and they got a number which was bigger than Kolmogorov's prediction. So, so the picture is from experiment rather than numerical? Uh, so, so these are different, uh, basically. So K41 is the line P on three, and then these are other sort of guesses as to what the correct scaling should be. And then there are, there are, there are some experiments plotted here, although it's a little bit hard to see at P equals two. Well, but there are lower dots there. <laughs> so so uh, I, I think these were taken from uh, experiments like measurements. Um, so Kolmogorov's, the one third came from mathematical argument, not from experiment. It's, it's a phenomenological theory uh, based on certain assumptions, which may or may not uh, be, be valid. All right. So. Uh, if we return to this concept of intermittency, uh, I think one could actually take as a definition of intermittency deviations from Kolmogorov's predictions. And the reason is basically if, if I look at this, this spike and I take a velocity increment, so I measure the velocity at this point and I subtract the velocity at this point, that spike is very costly when I cube it, but not as costly when I square it. And so that's that's what intermittency has to do with the deviations from Kolmogorov's predictions. And revisiting our theorem then, that what it's really about is demonstrating that there exists a wide class of solutions to the Euler equations, which exhibit that particular deviation from Kolmogorov's scaling. And this was the first construction of such solutions that had this kind of scaling uniformly in time. And uh, it turns out that intermittency is, of course, crucial to the construction. Um, of course, in analytical ways, it's crucial. I'm a PD person. We do estimates. But uh, sometimes you get to draw pictures, too. And uh, one way that intermittency en enters is uh, you have these big tangled messes of uh, periodized cylinders that uh, Xiao Yitao mentioned. And uh, at one point in the iteration, one has different sets of these objects and they're sort of deformed and moved around and you want to prevent them from intersecting in some region of space time. And it's not hard to imagine that the sparser these objects are, the easier it is to prevent intersections. So that's what intermittency, that's part of what intermittency has to do with the construction. And uh, yeah, one can of course quantify this a little bit more accurately, but uh, that's part of the proof. And in terms of things that I'd like to think about, I think one interesting question would be to take a different invariant of the Euler equations, namely the helicity, and construct a solution for which this object is well-defined at every time and maybe not conserved. Uh, and, and similarly, as Xiao Yutao mentioned, uh, one could try and use Kami's integration to demonstrate the sharpness of other thresholds. For example, analogs of Onsnogger conjectures. <clears throat> 
And with that, uh, I will thank you for your attention.